we're back with another episode of On Time, and we have somebody here who has a very rare skill, actually a very rare profession, and that is engine turning. And no, it is not automotive. Well, you know what? Let's get right to it. Let's go ahead and welcome Josh or Josh. Josh. You can find him on Instagram as at engine turned, right? Turned with a D. Turned with a D. That's me. Okay. So Josh, tell us a little bit about how you got into the world of aurology. All right. Well, I had the rare opportunity of growing up in a machine shop. My father and grandfather were both machinists and also ran a sandblasting business. So every summer, I'd spend my summers at a machine shop. And I probably am the only person you know who at six years old smelted gold, which is not the most common thing to do during your summer vacation. I always loved working with my hands, loved metal, and I liked the history of machines and these old types of crafts. You know, as I grew up, I became a history major, entered the teaching profession, and as an adult, I found myself missing working with my hands. And that's when I discovered watches. And watches were a mix of the two things I loved, working with my hands and a lot of history. You said you were the only six-year-old that smelted gold? I'm sure there's not a lot of six-year-olds out there that have smelted gold, like melted it down from its solid state in a crucible, which gets it ready to be worked on for jewelry. I can say I don't know anybody myself who's done that. So I think uh, between the two of us, you're good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what really was my uh, my grandfather was a jack of all trades. And any question I had, you know, instead of just answering it, he would do it with me, which was pretty amazing. Um, he was a neat guy. I totally believe in that. So to get right into it, we have a few samples of your work here on the table in front of us. And one of the things that somebody will notice if they look at this or look at engine turning in general It's not necessarily the pattern, but to my eye, and this is subjective, it's the brilliance of it Mm -hmm. versus achieving the same pattern through some sort of emboss or deboss or pressing it of some sort. Mm -hmm. So can you give us an idea why that might be? Yeah. So one of the things that makes engine turning and guilloche unique is that the cut made by the tool is an absolutely brilliant cut. If something's stamped, you lose that sharpness, that crispness of the cut. Even on a CNC machine, the CNC machines can't pick up the nuances that you get with the tool that's controlled with your hand along with the machine. And that really shows up when you look at a watch that has a true engine turned or guilloche dial on it. A lot of people say they can instantly notice the difference between a stamped dial or a actual engine turned dial. I think I'm one of those people. You can instantly recognize a guilloche dial versus a stamp dial. There's a lot of companies that try to imitate it, but it's just not the same. The guilloche ones, they just seem more three-dimensional. There's just so much more depth to it. And you're right about the accuracy. It's just so much sharper. That makes a lot of sense because if you think of taking a piece of metal and then finally carving it, All those carve marks, as long as your tool is sharp, should be very highly polished and brilliant. And then your edges should be sharp. So you have this brilliance from the work versus a pressed dial will not have fine edges. You're creating little dents in and out. So you're going to have basically a bit of a curved ridge between them. Plus, because you're stressing the metal, you're not going to get that fine high polish because the stress of the metal will make it less brilliant and it certainly is not going to polish it in the process. The distortion that's happening when you're pressing the metal, it's kind of like pressing a wheel, you know, a wheel from a car or forging it and then cutting it from a CNC. Obviously something that's going to be CNC cut is going to be a lot sharper and just look a lot better in my opinion, but there's an aspect of cost involved. So My assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, is your dials aren't cheap. My dials are not cheap. And let's be honest, in the luxury world of watches today, if we want a watch that tells excellent time, we can just look at our phones. But the value that we ascribe to luxury watches a lot of the time is the amount of hand time that went into it, the amount that an artisan is sitting there polishing a bevel or engine turning a dial. And that creates a lot of value for a lot of people that someone's pouring their heart and soul to create this one piece for you. 
rather than something that's been stamped out 10,000 times or replicated a thousand times on a CNC machine. I definitely think there's value to getting what you want. I think that, in fact, is one of the aspects that really defines luxury is something that is appealing to the user. Although, as much as I agree with you on that point, I actually have to respectfully disagree about the use of a phone as a good watch or as a good good time-telling machine. And I've said this to a number of people, and I do believe that it's true. In general, digital watches, digital displays are not as conducive to our understanding of time, nor do they really represent the passage of time as well as an analog display. Because with a digital display, you don't get a relative position, which is what for most people is more important. Just like with a digital dash speedometer, we have the technology to have digital dashboards, but most people prefer to see the analog readout because the relative speed, relative time is oftentimes more important than knowing that it's 513. That makes a lot of sense. People need to know how late they're going to be. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) Touche. So how do you transition from a teaching profession into engine turning? Well, I still am a teacher. I teach history. I'm actually an administrator as well. I'm a vice principal. And luckily, my job doesn't start till the afternoon. So I spend my mornings every morning engine turning and working on watches. I got into this when my wife gave me a watch when we got married. And I knew very little about watches. And I walked into Feldmar, which is a great luxury watch store here in Southern California. And they had a giant poster of a Chrono Swiss chronograph that was completely skeletonized. And I just sat there staring at that, amazed at the level of complexity that goes into this watch. And I thought to myself, you know, it would be really incredible if I could learn how these work and maybe even try to skeletonize something myself. That's what I did. I enrolled in an online course through Time Zone, which gives you all the materials and watches to work on, and you learn how to take it apart and assemble it. And after I did that, I felt very confident. I uh, took a saw and I started skeletonizing, and I completely and utterly destroyed that first watch. <laughs> I still have it, it's in pieces, but I was hooked. After that, I kept learning as much as I could about watches. I kept practicing my skeletonizing. Some friends took pity on me and bought some of my first skeleton watches. (laughs) Yeah, good friends. Good friends. (laughs) They're very good friends. And then I met a man who was interested in a watch with a dial. I had yet to ever make a dial before. And he wanted it half skeletonized and half with the dial. At that point, I had already uh, picked up the Bible, aka watchmaking. That was my first introduction to engine turning. And luckily, at the same time, Roger Smith had just put out a wonderful series of videos on engine turning, both with a Rose engine and a straight line machine. So I sat there just mesmerized by this process. And I made that first dial without any engine turning. I took the money from the sale of that watch and found a man who had a straight line engine for sale. I bought it. It was a few hundred pounds. And my first straight line engine, I set up in the breakfast nook outside of my kitchen. (laughs) It definitely was a conversation starter. With your wife or with other people? (laughs) All of the above. All of the above. Anyone that walked in stopped, looked and said, what in the world is that? There's so much to learn with every single aspect of watchmaking. The people that actually make the watches are learning so many different skills, have so many different talents to be able to make every single component of the watch and and the dial included. George Daniel's watchmaking book is hundreds of pages and each section of that is a complete and utter mastery of each section to be able to actually make a working watch. And I decided that I would just focus on dials and see if I could make the best dials that could be possibly made uh, here in the United States. And that's sort of been my mission. I want to make the absolute best dials that you can get in the United States. And in my opinion, the best dials out there, the dials that take the most 
creativity, that take the most skill, that take the most time and patience is an engine turned dial. There's a, a lot that goes into it. Let's talk about that a lot. You mentioned two different types of machines. There's the rows versus the straight line. So can exactly. you tell us what the difference is? Yeah. So in short, a rose engine machine makes circular guilloche mm -hmm. or circular lines. A straight line machine makes lines that go up and down or in a zigzag. Anyone that has followed or looked at watches has seen examples of both. But unless you've worked with the machines, uh, it's usually difficult to tell the difference between the two. But if you're looking at a watch and you see lines that are going vertical, that was made on a straight line. If you see lines that are curvy and going around in a circle, that's a rose engine machine. Both machines have an interesting way they work. Where the dial is put on the front of the machine, the whole machine moves in the position of a rosette or a pattern bar. So in order to make that pattern, the entire dial is moving in the path of that design. It's similar to tracing a line for a straight line machine. The machine follows a path on this bar, which is called a pattern bar. There's a serrated surface that has little peaks mm -hmm. and the machine follows along that and moves back and forth. The position that it's moving back and forth creates the pattern that you see on the dial. Okay. With the Rose Engine machine, it's the same thing, except it's moving in a zigzag and the workpiece is in the middle. So every one of the bumps on the rosette, which is the bronze pieces that you see on these machines, makes the machine move in a circle with a zigzag pattern. So what it sounds like or what it looks like is happening is that the machine is translating a large pattern or a die or the original of a large pattern then onto this smaller surface. It's literally shrinking it down and that's how it's creating the pattern. Am I understanding it correctly? Correct. Especially for the Rose engine. For the Rose engine, it takes that shape and copies it down to the smaller size. On a pattern bar, on the straight line machine, it's the exact same size it shows up on the pattern bar mm -hmm. is what shows up on the dial. That is interesting. So they do operate a bit differently. Just to give our listeners maybe a reference that they can use, imagine if you had one of your wheels from a car and on the outside rim, there was a pattern of something and you put the object, the dial in the center of your wheel, like the cap, and then you were you had a cutting tool on that. As the wheel moves and you have the large pattern on the outside rim, it's going to translate that on a very, very small scale onto whatever is mounted in the center of the wheel. Yeah, that's a really great description. That pretty much nails it. I had a funny experience. I have one rosette or one cam which traces the pattern that was shaped as a heart on valentine's day i thought it would be fun to create a engraving of a heart using this heart-shaped rosette and with that one you can really clearly see that the machine is moving in the position of a heart well the cutter is tracing that position of the heart and a lot of people are really curious like how it was possible that i was doing that Humorous to me, the video went viral. I got 85,000 views of me making a cute little heart <laughs> on Valentine's Day, where I have all these other things up on my Instagram that I pour my heart and soul in and spend countless hours on and have significantly less views than <laughs> 85,000. You know, people found that pretty interesting. You are a part of a very small demographic. Being a serious watch collector is already a small part of a pretty mm -hmm. large demographic, but engine turning in itself is like tiny. You are like a little speck on the watchmaking globe. Yeah, I would say so, although it's not without merit. Oh, definitely not without merit. And I also mean not just from a crafts point of view, but it's practical in a very strange way. And you know how I love being very practical about watches. Unlike something like enameling, unlike lacquer, unlike other finishes that you apply to a dial that will, in the case of enamel, can become damaged even if they don't degrade, but lacquers of all kinds eventually succumb to the effects of time sure. or moisture or the elements. You're not really applying anything here. This is still bare metal, especially in the case here where it is just the carved metal. So this is going to be a very resilient component as well. It's not like many of the other dial treatments that you can have that you have to baby or will certainly show the effects of time or wear. Where we see an example of that is with AL Breguet pocket yes. watches. 
this form of engraving really became popularized by him. You know, not only did he invent the turbione and many other inventions for watchmaking, but he was really the first person that popularized engine turning. His vision was with that, that engine turning really helps the owner differentiate different sectors and be able to very clearly see the time. Yes. And not only that, he realized, like you said, that this would be something that would stand the test of time. And so today you can still pick up a Breguet pocket watch that was made 215 years ago and the dial may have oxidized, but Mm -hmm. the engraving still looks like it came out of the factory yesterday, which is stunning. Which is actually funny. So you're talking about oxidation. Then in my mind, I'm thinking, well, what if you used a material that wouldn't oxidize? Hypothetically, then if you were to make a platinum dial, it will never change. Never. Two answers to that question. The first is what George Daniels, Breguet, Roger Smith, myself, Benzinger do is you can take silver. Mm -hmm. When you heat silver up, it'll turn black. It'll oxidize. Yes. If you take that silver and then put it in acid, the top layer of that black level will burn off and you'll have this pure white surface. Right. Then after that, you lacquer it and it'll last for a long time. Okay. Longer than you and I are going to be around to see it. The other answer is a more modern answer. I buy a type of sterling silver that is tarnish free. Us living in the 21st century, we have these incredible metallurgical advancements where they figured out a way to make silver that tarnishes at a much, much, much slower rate than traditional sterling silver. So I started incorporating that in all my watch dials. It's completely the same as sterling silver, except they've added some magical new uh, component that makes it very difficult for it to tarnish. But you can still do a dial out of platinum if someone were to order it. So it's interesting you say that. One of the people I work with is a man named David Walter. He makes incredible clocks, clocks that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and have insane complications in them. And he was trained as a watchmaker. He recently started making watches. He really loves engine turn dials. And a lot of my first projects have been with him. And he's working on a watch that is a platinum movement, platinum case. And we'll see about a platinum dial. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) That's going to be a heavy watch. The the dial makes sense. Movement, on the other hand, I'm a little bit skeptical about. Platinum, as we all know, is not the hardest material. Yeah, so it's interesting. He's working with platinum because traditionally why watch companies have stayed away from platinum is platinum is extremely difficult to machine. Yes. He's got 40 plus years of machining experience and he wanted a challenge. So he's actually already made a a working prototype with platinum. The platinum has been hard rolled, which means it's been pressed between two extremely heavy uh, rollers to get as flat and hard as possible. The metal is going to last the test of time, but traditional platinum is much softer, but so is gold. And F.B. Jorn and others have uh, made that work as well. So here's the question for you. How long does each dial take you to make? Let's say of the least complicated sort. Yeah. So of the least complicated sort, which is a dial made primarily on the rose engine machine, where it's a round pattern. From start to finish, that dial could be somewhere between 10 and 15 hours for all the processes, everything behind it. The engraving could be anywhere from two hours to four hours. For something like the basket weave, which you see on Breguet, which you see on George Daniels watches, which you see on Roger Smith watches, some Kerry Voutelain watches, it's the most complex of all the patterns. And that can take hours upon hours of work and concentration. It's hundreds of lines. Every line has to be perfect or near perfect. (laughs) And one mistake and all that work is down the drain. That's almost as labor intensive as putting out an episode of On Time. Almost, (laughs) yeah. This episode of On Time was recorded and engineered by Michael Senderovich with supervision by Tim Hatayama. Team OTP is Ken Shu Production and Savada and Dune on social media. Our theme song was composed and recorded by Hubie Wang. For the entire OTP team, this is Mike. And this is Chase. Thank you for listening to On Time. On Time.